Welcome to episode 8 of the Fight Night Forecast, where we highlight, recap, and cover all things boxing. How's it going, Justin? Not bad, James. How about you, buddy? Awesome. Let's get into it. Man, so we had a uh, a pretty big bout this weekend with, with uh, Tio and uh, uh, Josh Taylor. Tio ended up, um, I don't know if it was really a crazy upset um necessarily i know the the uh, betting odds were decently close but um in a lot of people's eyes to kind of upset taylor and and ran away with it so um i predicted it last week not trying to brag but um so did gary obviously gary was i'm sure gary probably jumped out of his socks when they gave to the decision but um shout out gary i know you're watching so um yeah, Tio did good. So, um, what do you think? What do you think about that fight, James? Yeah, they say Gordo is back. The old uh, power boxer is back, which is good. Yeah. Um, the the past probably couple fights seemed like Tio was trying to rely on that one punch power. He was trying to be that guy, um, but he has more tricks in his bag to to be doing that. So, um, I know in the pre fight build up. A lot was said and a lot of drama and, and all that, the exchanging of words. But I think the truth kind of came out the day before, the day of the fight. If you looked online and saw some interviews, you saw Tiafimo Sr. Um, saying, oh, my boy's going to box tonight. He's going to box his ears off and all this. Um, wow. And sure enough, got in there and boxed, uh, used some clever tricks and uh, used a ton of skill. And, yeah, I mean, pretty much dominated. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, like in the Cambosis fight, they were talking all that where he's like, I'm going to knock him out in the first round and like all this, you know, all the goofy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think that he really relied more on just his boxing and that's what he should do. He's a good boxer. He's very skilled. He's got great footwork, great like kinetic distance vision. You know what I mean? Like he's just he's a great athlete, you know, and he needs to stick to what's he's good at. You know, it, it, it's just, it's like a sprinter deciding they're going to become a marathon runner. You know what I mean? It's like, if you're an athlete, you know, if you're an athlete and you know what you're good at, just stick with it. You know, there's no sense of, um, I guess, fixing what's not broke. You know what I mean? Tio did so well. He beat Loma, um, with that same style beat, um, Omi with that, you know, all, all these, the guys, that he beat on the way up to becoming Tiafimo Lopez, you know, he fought a certain way. And then it's like, you, you know, you win the Los lineal titles and all that. <clears throat> and, um, and then it's all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to change what I'm doing. It's like, come on, man, you already, you made it to the top. Now it's time to just hone your skills even more. You know, I'm not against him, I guess, necessarily like being like, Hey, I want to work on my power and, and try to become, you know, a power puncher also, but, you know, just to completely switch your game up like that. Um, I thought it was kind of odd. But another thing I like to see was, you know, at the end of the um, the fight, they were pretty. They they had they had really good sportsmanship. They, they both, you know, they hugged and and um, Tio said, you know, hey, emotions got high. I don't want you to die. I want you to go back to your family and all that. So that was cool to see. You know, obviously for the build up to, for the fight, it makes it exciting to see those guys talk to trash. But then it's really cool to see the beef squash and then and them, uh, you know, hugging it out and. I, I don't know if you noticed at the end, Josh Taylor was like talking about wanting to run it back. And um, T.O. didn't really say anything. And he ended up talking about his his personal situation with his with his wife and his kids. Said his, he, you know, he said his next battle is going to be in court with for his son or whatever and and whatnot. So hopefully, hopefully he gets all that worked out and uh, gets back in the ring. So what what would you say like is the, the the number one thing T.O. did right? he was the counter puncher or he was even countering the counter in some cases for Josh totally shut Josh's game down. Yeah. And like I said, he pulled some clever tricks and stuff like that and stuff we can get into later if we need to, but shut down Josh's like toe to toe game, like mm -hmm. inside game. And then took control of the outside game, built yeah. confidence and basically Josh looked frustrated or unsure what to do, man, by like the middle of the fight. And he just took over. So. I think it was you that mentioned this to me on Saturday too. And I, I liked it. It was, um, 
he, he took away that southpaw angle, you know, and he did the same thing in the Loma fight too. He like moved into that, you know, when there, when you have a southpaw in an orthodox, for you guys that don't know, there's a certain angle that you can, yeah. you know, that a southpaw can use to gain control of the lead foot, you know, and, and be able to throw off that and pivot, you know. And Tio did a good job of instead of, he did this in the Loma fight too, instead of just letting the southpaw take that angle, he would move with the southpaw to almost cancel out like or negate that angle. Mm-hmm. Um, did it a lot too in the Taylor fight. And I noticed that. And I'm thinking to myself, when I'm a southpaw myself, I'm like, man, that's a, that's a southpaw killer right there. Just, just moving to his power side and almost negating that angle and just turning with the southpaw, you know? So, and honestly, at the end of the day, that just needed to be an adjustment that Taylor needed to make because there's, you know, obviously there's um, similarities with how a southpaw fights an orthodox and not an orthodox fights a southpaw. It's just mirrored. So whatever, whatever um, Tio was doing, Taylor could also have done, you know what I mean? And just, and, and adjusted his game plan and made it better. But it just seemed like to me, and I don't know what you think, but it seems like, Taylor was just off, man. I know he's had a little, little bit of ring rust, but he was like off balance. I feel like um, it seemed like when he was throwing his combinations, he was ending off balance. Like that lead hook he was throwing, he was just like either off balance one way or another, and he was kind of falling around the ring. And um, uh, again, it's easy for us to say as as spectators, you know, but it just didn't seem like the regular Josh Taylor that we've seen in the past. He just, like you said, it almost seemed like he gave up, you know, in the middle of those middle rounds. He almost was just like, just kind of throwing to, mm-hmm. to not, you know, knock that out. Right. Ran Pretty out much. of options. Yeah. Ran out of options and yeah, didn't probably didn't want to get hit by those big shots. I mean, T.O. was in his bag and feeling comfortable and, you know, dominating yeah. the fight. I mean, he was, he was lining up that rear uppercut too. I was very impressed with how he was, he was landing that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes landing that rear uppercut is, is tough, you know? So I was very impressed with Tio taking that angle and getting that in. So, um, yeah, I think he, he, uh, yeah, I thought he looked really good. I thought he looked really good. Um, what do you think's next for Taylor, man? You think he moves up to 47? I mean, he said he didn't have any issues with the weight cut. To 140, but he's not getting any younger. So, yeah, I don't know. I, man. Think he, I don't know. I don't think he, he, I mean, he didn't look bad at the weigh in or anything. No. I didn't. So, um, Tio obviously can make that weight pretty easy. That's, I'm not sure he had to cut. I mean, I'm sure he did, but I don't think he had to cut it obviously as much as 35. Like, it didn't seem like he was as drawn in. Tio seemed pretty, you know, vibrant. Well, this and, was uh, Taylor's first fight with the new trainer. So you got to think, you know, can they build more on that? The game plan was, I don't know. <laughs> I think maybe just shut down. I didn't see many adjustments that were fruitful. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the task only gets tougher at 147 if he's going to chase belts and champions. So yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what's next for Josh. He's either I mean he's got two options: stay at forty or go to forty-seven. I think either one has its own difficulties, you know. Because um, about forty-seven, you you know, probably have to work his way up a little bit. I don't think. I don't know, man. Because forty-seven could be almost wide open in a lot of ways. Because I think that after the Crawford Spence fight on the 29th of July, they're I'm pretty sure they're both moving up. So. Spence said for sure this is his yeah. last fight, forty-seven. So he's a big boy. He so yeah, yeah. So he said that he's been waiting on this, wait on the Crawford fight, and then he's done at forty-seven. I don't know. I mean, I who know? You, you know they're gonna have rematches, so they'll, they'll probably fight each other once or twice, possibly once or twice more. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So they'll probably fight each other, but I think they're done there. So really, you got like Boots Ennis at forty-seven. You got Stanionis at forty-seven, who's pretty good. Really, forty-seven, and once those two leave, man, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, stake that could be claimed. You know what I mean? Mm. That's so, interesting. I think at forty-seven. Yeah. I mean, what do you? 
No, yeah. With Spence and Crawford gone eventually within the next couple of years or whatever. Yeah, it could change the landscape. Younger guys are yeah. stepping up to, you know, from prospect to contender or contender to potential champions. Then you got the guys from 140 that'd be moving up. Yeah. Moving on to, to Tia Fimo. What's next for Tia Fimo? He mentioned retiring on Instagram. I saw that he posted. I'm saying that he's uh, thankful for boxing and everything it's done for him and his family. But he said that um, he's or he is retiring on top. So um, whether he's being for real or not, I'm not sure. Um, what do you think? Do you think this is him being serious or he's just kind of doing like goofy T.O. stuff? Or what do you think? A theory I heard was that supposedly he had signed like a two-year extension uh, with top rank like a year ago or whatever. And so the theory is that he kind of ices that contract. He retires and then waits it out, does the court thing, the personal issue thing. And then once that extension expires, he comes back as a free agent or under his own promotional banner in 2024 or whenever picks, picks up where he left, left off. (laughs) You know what I mean? I heard this thing too, where they were saying that, I mean, Tio said it in an interview, it might've been with, uh, the, I know Sean Porter had him on on the Porter way and a couple other people have had him on. He said on one of those podcasts that he said he wouldn't come back for anything under eight figures or nine figures or something like that. I'm like nine figures, but that's I'm like, come on, man, let's be, let's be real here. <laughs> but I think he's, I think he's pointing out the fact that he's not getting paid enough. He's not getting paid you know, what he thinks he's worth, you know, and Tio, I think really, I think Tio is a big draw. He mentioned that over the, over the span of time he's been with top rank, he's made them over a hundred million dollars and he's only been paid a maximum of like 1 million. I, I agree with your theory. I think he might be trying to wait out that top rank deal, but I think more than anything, he's just, I think he's just pretty ticked off about not getting paid what he's worth. And he's like, I'm not coming back until I get a deal that's worth it for me. So um, nonetheless, man, I, congratulations to Tio. I think that um, he did a great job. I hope he's not retired, especially after how well he performed. But I will say that if this is the last time we see Tio in the ring, um, what a what a way to go out, you know? Um, what a way to perform and and what a way to end a end a good career. What's going on, y'all? Thank y'all for tuning in the podcast so far. Just want to take a minute to shout out our sponsor, Young Winston. They sent us these awesome hoodies. They sent us a little bit of the gear. Got this wallet. I think it's great. I love it. I actually switched my own wallet and used this. Really easy to use, sleek, nice, easy in and out of your pocket. Pull your cards out easy. I love it. They also have things like gold wrist chains. They have a backpack that I also use. Um, it's got a very, very nice, convenient USB port so you can charge your laptop and stuff. It's great. Sleek, durable leather. Love it. Um, yeah, they, they gave us a discount code LTR5 for 5% off the entire site, whatever you want. Let's get back into the podcast, guys. Thank you for tuning in. All right, y'all. Question of the week. Is Tiafimo Lopez's resume a Hall of Fame resume or not? Like right now. If he is done with boxing and he never fights again, is he a Hall of Famer? Oof, or, I'm no Hall of Fame expert, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty impressive in a short amount of time. He's a two-weight world champion. Yeah, man, you can make a case for it. Short and right. sweet, you know? And if and when he comes back, he can build on that legacy even more. Because as he ages, I could see him going up to 147 and, you know, possibly become a champion there. It'd be three-weight division. Yeah. All right, so for me, I'm going to say I'd like to see a little more out of him just to, you know, to see him get in the Hall of Fame. I don't know. I, I think that, yeah, dude, I mean, like, the, his resume is great, right? And, yeah, seven world, you know, seven world titles is really impressive. And there's some guys that have made the Hall of Fame that might not even have had that many titles. But at the same time, a lot of guys in the past in the Hall of Fame, that was before before the four belt era, you know what I mean? And he's fought more talent, you know, people have fought more talent in the past. So, you know, I don't, I'm not hating on Tio's resume. And I think it definitely is an impressive resume, but I'd really like to see him have maybe one or two more real legacy fights, you know what I mean? To really solidify that. 
Yeah, tell us what you guys think in the comments. Let us know. Do you think Tiafimo Lopez has a Hall of Fame record, or do you guys want to see him um, maybe do a little more to earn that that title of Hall of Fame? So, um, yeah, let us know in the comments. Hit us up. Other news, though, we had a DAZN card, Jaime Munguia versus uh, Deborah Anchenko. So Munguia um, came out on top. Seems like Deborah Anchenko, that's kind of the story of his career. He, like, just kind of comes up just short on every big fight that he has so um james how do you what do you think of that fight how'd that fight go in your eyes yeah so i was watching the top rank card so thank goodness for those DAZN highlight videos man they are the ones who do it they they'll put out like a 20 minute highlight video which is awesome but no so i had to tune into that watch the recap and uh man sluggers two two punchers going at it I was surprised to see that it was actually at 168. So they both moved up for this fight. Um, there's no belt, on the, no real major belt on the line or anything like that. So um, maybe it made sense and maybe set up some f- future fights for them at 168. But uh, yeah, came out swinging on the first few rounds. Um, like you said, off camera, maybe um, started to slow down a little bit in the middle, but um, picked it up at the end again. Mungi proves that he has punch resistance and he could take, you know, take a punch. He's got a good chin. Is that great for longevity? Uh, probably not, but uh, yeah, man, we, I saw his neck snap back multiple times. Devonchenko is a shorter, stockier guy. He's always kind of short for the weight, even at middleweight. Um, but yeah, he's dangerous. He's kind of a swarmer. He'll duck under your shots and throw big hooks or whatever. Um, just kind of will be, on you you know causing problems and he did that with danny jacobs and caused problems for triple g i love me a good action-packed fight like that sometimes i prefer those types of fights over you know the the nice smart technical ones because man it's just entertaining to have all that action so uh yeah mongia comes away with a close decision i think on the scorecards it was actually primed for a majority draw so two judges basically had it 114, 114, but they had one point deducted for the late um, knockdown. So it was like uh, 114, 113 were two of the cards. So once again, uh, Sergey Devrancheco uh, comes up a little short, unfortunately, but he's he's a tough guy. And I mean, he makes a fan out of people like me. Uh, Jaime has been kind of on the slow track. It's kind of like what they do nowadays in general, but especially with Golden Boy, really slow roll the career. I think he has like 30 fights, if not more. And so I think it's time to take on a big name or get in line for a big name. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Maybe down the line we'll see a Munguia Benavidez or a Munguia, Munguia um, Canelo. Um, we'll see. But, yeah, should be coming soon. I'd be curious to see if, if Munguia stays at 68 or if he goes back down to 60. I don't know. Um, yeah, I agree with the, the you know, Golden Boy kind of draws out careers a little bit. But I think I think Devrinchenko was a good step up for him. You know, mm-hmm. I think that – Oh, yeah. That was, a good, that was a good fight. And I think that, yeah, both those guys proved that it was a good fight. And I think, um, you know, now it's time, like you said, Munguia to take another step up. I think that – Devrinchenko was a good um, stepping stone. He's been in there with some big, big guys, big names. And um, like we said earlier, just came up a little short on all those guys. So it goes to show that Devrinchenko can get in there and, 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 you know, play with the best of them. So if Munguia can beat him, then, you know, um, I think Munguia can, you know, kind of prove now that he's able to get in that same playing field and be in the mix with those guys. So, um, yeah, I'd be – Excited to see what's next for both those guys, honestly. And lastly, for the this past weekend, we had a exhibition. Yeah, pre, I guess an exhibition more or less with Floyd Mayweather and John Gotti the third turned into a ref stoppage that turned into a backyard street brawl, more or less. It seemed like the ref was given direction multiple times throughout the bout i can't remember i just watched highlights of this and there wasn't even really a lot of highlights posted when i was looking it seemed like i want to say was it round four or five or something like that that it got called and the the ref was kenny bayless so obviously a you know future hall of fame ref he was saying something about holding the head or something 
I think Gotti was, Gotti kept holding the back of Mayweather's head or something along those lines where they, he didn't like, there was something he saw they didn't like and it kept happening. And so the ref called the fight. I think, well, Mayweather said something to him and I didn't, I didn't quite catch it, but Mayweather said something to him and then that just sent Gotti off and he just swum past the referee <laughs> and just started swinging. I think that might've been the first time I've ever seen Mayweather in a full on high guard. I don't know if you saw that clip, <laughs> but Mayweather sitting there in a high guard, you know, and I think, uh, from what it looks like, Mayweather Mayweather gave him one or two to to take with him on the road. So he hit him with like one or two small shots as they as every as the crowd hopped in and, and separated every not the crowd but the the teams hopped in and separated everything. So gave him a little two piece with a drink for the flight home. Yeah, I don't know. I I like these Mayweather um, exhibitions. He probably just pocketed another. Five ten million right there or something like that, but yeah, I think it's cool. I mean, and you could tell Mayweather has fun with it. And honestly, the beginning of the fight wasn't that bad. It seemed like Gotti had he might have been a little in and a little over his head. Like he seemed like he was he was a little starstruck by the moment. He didn't throw a lot of punches. Did you watch any of it at all? Or no, I just got a couple highlights online, mostly of the aftermath. You were saying his, his was it his granddad? His granddad was like kind of a big mafia. Yeah, he Good was mafia a mafia, guy. yeah, mob boss in uh, New York City back in the day. Kind of a feared yeah. guy back in those times, but we'll see. We'll see if Mayweather comes up missing or something. Now you got Mayweather. I, I highly doubt it. That's what I was thinking. I got, you got Mayweather out here messing with the mob. All right, a little recap from this past weekend. We had a Friday fight. Adrian Broner's return outpoints Billy Hutchinson. I'll be be honest. The problem is probably not one of my favorite boxers, but it's good to see someone back in the ring, uh, get him a payday, and um, we'll see. Uh, they were talking about a uh, Adrian Broner Roly Romero fight at 140, so that might be one of the few times I've ever rooted for uh, a Broner. So yeah. <laughs> let's see Broner and uh and Roly, but we'll see if that happens. But a little side yeah. note, um, we had mentioned this last week on the podcast. Um, a local Midwest kid, Joshua Clark out of Minnesota was actually on that Don King card, that Adrian Broner card. He was actually a B side took on, I believe an undefeated fighter and came away with the upset. So shout out to him, Josh Clark and, uh, uh the team up there at strike fitness and Valhalla combat. His dad was in his corner, um, which is cool to see. And so, yeah, it's, it's always good to see an underdog win, and especially one that you've been kind of watching. So shout out to Josh right. Clark. Do you have any thoughts on Adrian Broner's return? Yeah, um, it seemed like he, you know, didn't – I mean, I, I think you would have liked to seen him get him out of there, I guess. But, you know, there's a rush, you know, shake off the rust. Um, and it seemed like he was, you know, the reflexes were still there, the athleticism still there, so – yeah, I'm excited to see what comes next. I think this is his chance to kind of uh, get back into it, get back into the game. And uh, now it's uh, – like to see him up the competition a little bit. I wouldn't mind seeing him with Rolly Romero. I think that, um, you know, as goofy as Romero can be, sometimes uh, he's a good power puncher. Mm -hmm. Your Broner is to sort of uh, box, and obviously he's um, – Romero's a uh, full-time boxer as opposed to a lawyer, a lawyer by trade and Billy Hutchinson. Uh, it just has the, you know, lower level pro experience. So I guess it's better than uh, fighting a lawyer is probably better than fighting a taxi cab driver, but yeah, but props to Billy Hutchinson, man, you know, everyone can kind of make fun of him for just kind of doing this on the side, but, or whatever. But I mean, Hey, he's doing something he loves. Um, he got a, probably got a little bit of a good payday fighting Broner, you know, and he made it all 12 rounds. So you can't, there's nothing to hang your hat on. So I think it's great, man. I think it's great that he um, is following his dreams in the boxing ring and, and, and you know, obviously he's making a living on the, on the side, being a lawyer and stuff too. So yeah, no, no knock on the hustle, but um, obviously it's just, you can just tell there's just a slight different level between him and Broner. So but yeah, shout out Bill Hutchinson for, for, uh, you know, giving Broner a fight in the ring and, and surviving all 12 rounds. So, yeah, I had a chance to go down to um, Nashville, Tennessee to visit some friends down there um, this weekend. Good time. Good time. And you know me. 
you know me, the boxing guy that I am, I had to go stop into some of the gyms down there while I was down there. So took a minute away from from hanging out with some friends that I told him I was like, hey, I got to go over and check this gym out. So popped into Fighters Gym in Nashville, talked with some of the coaches there. Yeah, Coach Billy down there. Shout out Coach Billy. He said he might be watching this weekend, so he might also hop on the uh, the pod here pretty soon. Maybe um, after one of these big fights, we'll have him uh, do some analysis maybe or something and kind of rep the gym a little bit. Coach Christy, who runs the gym down there, she is a um, uh, USA boxing certified coach as well as Billy. And she also was um, an Olympic coach in 2012. So that was kind of cool to see all the uh, the Olympic teams that she coached. It was like Errol Spence and uh, Clarissa Shields, just a couple of her name on that 2012 Olympic team in, in London. So it was pretty cool, man, to see that, that she like directly worked with them. And she's got pictures of them all over the walls in there. And so it was cool to see um, they had a bunch of pictures of Caleb Plant when he was in the amateurs. So that was super cool to see that. Yeah, then I they actually were they were super cool about me coming in and visiting. They actually let me just kind of come in there and do a little workout too. So I got in there, did uh, some rounds in the heavy bag. I actually did a little bit of pad session with Coach Billy, and um, he you know gave me a uh, a few pointers on some things that I was um, asking for like a different opinion on. It's pretty cool. They have a pretty good operation down there, and they um, yeah shout them out. So if you're in the Nashville, Tennessee area, or uh, ever there to visit or whatever slide into uh fighters boxing gym in nashville give him a shout tell him that you heard about him on the pod up and coming what do we got coming up james we got a couple bouts this weekend yes sir yeah we have uh my guy tim zoo fighting ocampo who is also kind of a power puncher um so should be some action it's actually sunday in australia i believe uh so a little yeah, bit yeah. of time difference there but yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. Saturday night, we have Regis Progre, his return, which makes things a little interesting coming right off the back of T.O. versus Taylor. Yeah, because Taylor beat him. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that might be – I think that's a really good matchup for T.F. Emo. That might be something we see coming up pretty soon if T.O. is not free about retiring you know, or whatever he needs to take his time off or whatever he needs. I'd like to see that. I don't know. Absolutely. I'm not sure who I would take in that bout yet. I have to do a little more, probably a little more analysis on it, but um, might just, I might just uh, hop on the old uh, T.O. train with Conductor Gary and to see, see, uh, I might just say he wins against Prograde too. We'll see. So. Yeah, well, if if he's anything like he was uh, this weekend, yeah, he's gonna give anybody problems in and around yeah. that weight class. So, but Progray is thinking. no joke, man. Progray is no joke. I mean, honestly, at this point, I, I think I mean it's it's Tio and Regis that are the two guys to see at 140. Progray had a great fight against Taylor, and then Tio beat Taylor, and Taylor was the man at 140. Progray, he has. Overall, like the the American style, but yeah. what's cool is he cites like, or in the past he had cited two of his favorite boxers or two of his you know biggest influences were Mike Tyson and Roberto Duran, which also are some of my favorite fighters too. So yeah, his style I could see it in his style. Um, he's definitely not a Muhammad Ali or on the back foot. He likes to brawl. Uh, he's got power. He's tough. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd like to see him and Tio because Tio is big, strong, uh, tough, explosive. So that'd be a good matchup. Yeah, I think so. I really do think so. Uh, shout out to uh, our sponsor, Young Winston. You can use code LTR5 to get 5% off the entire site. Get things like the uh, the hoodie here, man. I love this color. It's like a um, – I don't know if you guys can see it very well. It's like a salmon. Kind of a salmon color. Um, they got all types of colors and t-shirts, hoodies, um, long sleeves, you know, whatever you're whatever you're into, man. They got it over at Young Winston. They got a few other things, got like wallet. Um, we got a you know backpack. This is the backpack I got here uh hanging up on the wall. So um, yeah, check it out, man. Nice sleek leather stuff. Um, it's vacation season right now, man. You can sling one of those on your back, use it as a carry-on. Um, you know what I mean? You can uh, 
stuff a pillow in it and, and have a pillow fight with your best friend, whatever you want to do. Um, young Winston, man, they got you, they got your back. So thank you guys so much for tuning in as always. Please like, comment, subscribe, answer the uh, question of the week, turn on post notifications, man, click whatever, click whatever you can right along the bottom of this video here. That'd be so dope. Talk trash to us in the comments. Tell us we're the worst podcasters you've ever seen. Whatever you want to do, just let us know. Talk to us. We uh, we will love to answer you. Uh, we, and if you're looking for an argument in the comments, we got you. We'll give you an argument in the comments, whatever you want to do. But no, dead ass. Appreciate you guys. Thank you guys so much. Um, and we'll see you guys next week.